I received this transcript from Bill Baldwin, uh, one of the prosecutors for Justice Jackson, who was a second in below Colonel Amon. And Bill Baldwin, when I interviewed him in New Hampshire, I asked him, I said, is there anything I should be asking you? And he pulled out of his drawer a transcript, and he started reading it. And he just was, was very engaging. Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to what Colonel Amon said. Listen to this. And then he said, uh, when he got done, I said, would you like a copy of it? And I said, yes, I would. So he gave it to me. And I'm going to give it to you. And I know this brings back memories of... I mean, just, just to look at. Just to look at. Yeah. Well, and I'll get you to copy. Before I look at this, I should tell you, I have a whole box full of really? interrogations, which uh, I don't believe include any by Justice Jackson, but I don't know whether you have an archiving function there. We do, yeah. Yeah, I, you, you know, I was going to give them to the Leo Beck Society, but I, I just gave them the original copy of my uh, indictment, and I would have rather given it to you, but if you're interested. Oh, but let me look at those. So I'll see if that brings back some memories. Oh, sure. <laughs> so well, I, I tell you, it's, it's one of the... Uh, this is one of the scenes uh, that I describe in my book. Uh, well, you, you know, Rudolf Hess uh, once was the uh, principal deputy of Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there was always some confusion. He was the principal deputy of Hitler for the leadership of the party. He, he was never really the principal deputy as head of state. Goering became that later, but uh, Hess, you know, as you know, uh, stole, uh, absconded with an airplane to England. I mean, you know, the whole story trying to persuade the British to uh, make a separate peace so that Hitler could uh, attack uh, the Soviet Union in, with nobody else to worry about. And in, uh, in England, uh, he, he then exhibited some strange symptoms. I mean, he started hoarding food samples because he believed uh, his British captors were trying to poison him, and he certainly behaved irrationally. At any rate, at the end of the war, he was a prisoner in Britain, and he was brought to Nuremberg. And when he arrived at Nuremberg, and I can't remember now whether that was the first time uh, that he did this, but at Nuremberg, from the very beginning, he claimed to have amnesia. Mm -hmm. And because he had amnesia, and by the way, he was an, an unindicted material witness like all of the other defendants. I mean, when I first met them, you know, in July and August, they weren't, they weren't indicted on, until October the 20th. And our job was basically to find out who should be indicted and for what. Because in general, we knew what had happened, but we didn't know who had done what. So at any rate, uh, Hess was an unindicted material witness who pretended to have total amnesia. And uh, be before I look at this, uh, Eamon, who was the chief in in interrogator, I mean, clearly had a vested interest in, in proving, if he could, that uh, S was faking it. And uh, the question, I mean, arose whether, in fact, uh, with a diagnosed and, and uh, confirmed amnesia, uh, he was fit to stand trial. Right. So I, I remember a meeting with, before I look at this one, uh, with Eamon and the, uh, court, the court psychiatrist, Douglas Kelly, Kelly. where we talked to, uh, to Hess, and he used a word, a German word, Klatter, which is slang for a, uh, high school students folder for his papers. And I said to him, isn't it strange that you would remember this word? Where do you know it from? And I mean, he and the psychiatrist just wouldn't pick up on it. So I was convinced from the beginning, from some words that he used, right, uh, that uh, he was faking it. Mm -hmm. And Eamon, of course, wanted to prove the opposite. And what this is here, uh, I mean, I remember you know, the meeting very, very well. All these people were present with Hess, you know, in an attempt uh, 
basically to uh, shock him mm -hmm. into admitting him that he knew them. And I remember, I mean, I'd have to look at it and see whether it's contained in here. I remember Goering preening himself and saying, don't you remember me, Rudolph? I was the chief of the Luftwaffe. I was in chief in charge of the economy. We marched down the street together and he got a blank stare, you know, from Hess. And uh, you, you know that Haushofer was his old, you know who Haushofer was. He was the, originally a general in the German army, later became a professor at the University of Munich, and he was the inventor of the concept of Lebensraum. Oh. Yeah, and his son uh, followed in his footsteps, and uh, Lebensraum, you know, meant to them enough area, enough land, their great ambition was to have Germany to be agriculturally independent of its neighbors, as France was. France always had a surplus, and Denmark had a surplus, but Germany did not. And the whole theory of Lebensraum, you know, was about having enough space uh, to grow enough wheat and potatoes to feed the German people. And Haushofer was the mentor of Hess and has carried the doctrine of Lebensraum yeah. into the Nazi party, and Hitler embraced it, and according to Haushofer, completely perverted it. Because what Haushofer claimed he had meant is that he wanted to make arrangements and treaties and possibly uh, establish some kind of German sovereignty over their neighbors to create, you know, a whole unit. So Hess had lived in the Haushofer Household, by the way, Haushofer was married to a Jewish woman whom uh, Hess had served, saved from extermination. Haushofer was, I even in his late 70s, uh, all these other people were brought in. And let me just read here. Sure. Now, because I, I've tried to give you from memory what I remember years going, uh, you ought to know me. We've been together for years. Well, that must have been the same time, said Hess. As the book that was submitted, Goering, uh, don't you know me? <laughs> ah, not personally, but I remember your name, says Hess. And uh, now, Goering, but we talked a lot together. Let, let me see what oh, I can, what I can find the point where he bragged about how important he was and how crushed he was that even his august uh, titles didn't get. Yeah, here's Goering, you see, I told you. Listen, Hess, I was the supreme commander of the Luftwaffe, and you flew to England in one of my planes. Don't you remember that I was the supreme commander of the Luftwaffe? First, I was a field marshal, and later a Reichs marshal. Don't you remember? And uh, I remember Hess staring at him and saying, no. Don't you remember that I was made a Reichsmarschall at a meeting of the Reichstag, so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can tell oh. my memory of the occasion was <laughs> reasonably accurate, but I have to tell you, he was a householder, and I, I'd have to look at this to see whether it's reflected in here. Haushofer broke out in tears when Hess, who had been his protege, and whom he regarded as a son, by the way, before that, uh, we had Hess meet with his secretaries who ran shrieking and weeping from the room because their idealized boss, Hess, didn't recognize him. Well, Haushofer wept. Well, he brought pictures. I, I just see here Haushofer. And uh, I don't know whether you know, he committed suicide. I did know. He and his wife committed suicide, uh, I think, uh, maybe a month or two after meeting Hess, and uh, did not leave Kopje's notes, but um, Haushofer had been put in concentration camp, mm. you know, by Hitler before the war was over because he felt that uh, Hitler, and to the extent that Hess had served Hitler, had been traitors, I mean, to his idea, which was really ludicrous. Uh, so 
Do I remember? Yes, I remember that scene sure. very, very well. <laughs> well. It was too good. And Bill Baldwin was reading it, all of a sudden there's Sonnenfeld. I saw that and I said, man, that's perfect. Well, Bill Baldwin was it, 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 This is not an extra copy, is it? Pardon? This is not an extra copy. You can have that if you want. I've got one back in the office. I, I tell you, I'd love to have it because... Uh, fact, I, I tell done. you, it's one of the scenes I described in my book from memory. And, uh, I'm trying to think. I think your, in fact, your signature's on this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no question about that. This, this, this is the, uh, uh, among the folks, uh, Gehring showed up, and I think also uh, Haushofer, he's here. I, I remember Gehring and Haushofer, and the secretaries, which was another meeting. And Von Poppen came in. That I don't remember. I mean, said Von Poppen, came, but they don't, yeah, he's, he was here. Well, you wouldn't remember Von Poppen even when you saw him. <laughs> 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 interesting they all kind of stayed there they kind of well, you must have had a room full of people because they seemingly Gary came in and he stayed there and then came uh, according to this Haushofer came in and, oh yeah and then went all the way down to Von Poppen and then they talked to uh, uh, a guy named well I mean you I'm, I'm sure you know the end of the story and that uh, the court ordered after he was indicted he was indicted and he was in the court, and the court ordered him to be examined by, among others, uh, Soviet psychiatrists. And uh, in order to avoid that examination, Hess stood up in the court and he said, you know, I have an announcement to make. And you know what the announcement was? I can hear his words like today. From today on, my memory will again be available to the outside world. <laughs> That's terrific stuff. <laughs> well, by by the way, the uh, the picture there that I showed you with Hess being examined in, you know, one of my books, that's one of the early exams where we tried to, uh, you know, penetrate his pose of amnesia. And at the next stage, the, the there got to be a copy of the uh, interrogation where, you know, in, interesting, very macabre, Douglas Kelly was a professor of psychiatry from... Uh, the University of uh, California at Irvine, or one of the universities, right? And he, he was appointed as a psychiatrist by the court, not to be confused with Martin Gilbert, who was a psychologist and spent a lot of more time there. And you, I'm sure you've read his diary. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, Kelly committed suicide five years later, and I mean, he was so distressed then. but. We had an interrogation uh, with just uh, Eamon and Kelly and me, and I was bearing in on his language because he used words that only, I mean, made him talk about things that only a teenager would remember. Right. And, you know, then said to him, you know, how come you're using those words? And because they were in German, uh, you know, English, pe English speaking people couldn't pick up on it. Here is a copy of an original interrogation on which I talk, you read it in my book. Yes. Hess. This is Gehring and Hess and Sonnenfeld. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's an amazing story. And Claire Van Vleck was, uh, by the way, he was not a private, that's a mistake. He, he was a court reporter, a blonde, slight, young court reporter who was very good. He's, I'm sure he signed it. Yeah, Van Vleck did and Sonnenfeld so. I mean, I'm you, no, you sound, by the way, you sounded just like Bill Baldwin when he was telling the same story. Because Bill Baldwin apparently talked, uh, uh, just kind of sat in the corner with his boss. And uh, You know, I, I have to tell you, for whatever reason, I don't remember Bill Baldwin and what his function was, but Eamon, you know, presided over this weird scene. <laughs> yeah, well, it must have been weird, my golly. I'm going to also... Tell me about that picture. What was the circumstances under which you received an accommodation from Justice Jackson? Well, uh, you know that the so-called OUSCC, the Office of the U.S. Chief of Counsel, mm -hmm. uh, was first 
I, I believe a, uh, yeah, uh, for sure, a subordinate unit of OSS and uh, later, uh, I believe, became a, a unit that uh, reported directly to the Supreme Commander of U.S. forces in Europe, who sat in Frankfurt. And I, I, I believe it became a U.S. Army unit, but it was the OUSCC. And uh, I started, you know, as the first interpreter there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as more and more work came, uh, we needed more interpreters, and I was delegated to hire them. And uh, I was then known as chief of the interpretation section. I was a PFC, mm -hmm. and I had uh, captains and majors and uh, <laughs> lieutenants and sergeants and civilians uh, in the unit who were also anxious to meet these people and anybody, you know, who wanted to interpret had to come to me. And I had 12 interpreters, and uh, believe it or not, I also comment on this in my book, it was incredibly difficult to find them, even though there must have been hundreds of bilingual people in the U.S. Army in Europe, somebody who was out of his mind, got the State Department uh, to interview and select people and uh, send them to Nuremberg and out of... Excuse me, I can't remember Joe's last name. Gregson. Uh, out of those, uh, I went out eventually 12 interpreters. And then... Wait, who were they? They were just college educated German speakers or they were immigrants? I, I give you an example. I mean, a typical, a typical person sent over by the State Department came to me once and he was very effusive, uh, shook my hand and he says, Mr. Sonnenfeld, I am so glad to be here. I speak the seven languages and English the best. These were the most motley crowd, and I mean, that became a standing joke. They were selected by the State Department and flown over there. And by the way, I'll tell you what happened to them. It's very interesting. Many of them later became translators, and that was regarded as not as important as interpreters. However, they were very capable of translators because they were not under time pressure, and they could use a dictionary uh, you know, to make their translation, they could have somebody check their work. So there was always a competition uh, not to be denigrated if you want to be a translator. And some of the translators managed under certain, certain circumstances to be used as interpreters sort of on the side. At any rate, then the problem arose uh, when these interrogations got going, how, how to record them. And we decided to record them in England, English because we didn't want to trust German stenographers. So as the interpreter, I would take the English question of the interrogator, translate it into German for the witness, hear his answer in German, translate it back into English. And that's exactly how that interrogation was taken down. So right after the interrogation, the court reporter would, by the way, some of them uh, had stenotype machines. I mean, you know what they were in those sure, days. Sure. And some of them used Greg shorthand and others had their own system. And uh, we generally finished our interrogation at about 12, went to lunch and between one and two, I would read the rough copy, uh, you know, of that interrogation, which the stenographer typed out mark it up, and it would then be given to a typist. So between July and October the 20th, the day the indictments were handed out, and I, I was one, one of two people who handed them out, I had gone from being a single guy to having 50 people work under me. And uh, I, to this day, I don't know who prepared the citation, I, I assume it was General Gill who was a station commander. Uh, I don't know whether he did it at the behest of Jackson or Amon, but it uh, it was an Army commendation citation, which is the equivalent for an, you know of an officer would have gotten the Legion of Merit. I mean, it's, it's for non-combatant 
uh, c contributions. And anyway, uh, I have a copy of the original citation here, but Robert Jackson elected to award it to me personally because I had, uh, you know, interpreted for him. My office uh, was down the hall from him, and you know, he re he personally reviewed obviously all of the important interrogations that the interrogators fed him. I mean, that, that's where he got his knowledge, you know, of what these people were saying. And so, I mean, Jackson had really two sources of input. One came out of Story's documentation division, you know, where all of the German documents had to be translated into English, and with that, I had nothing to do. The other was the interrogation division under Eamon. Uh, and uh, I, I ran, uh, you know, the interpreting, uh, stenography, and and what have you. So uh, <clears throat> I was told to come up to uh, Jackson's office. That's, you know, where that picture was taken, and he he read the citation, which uh, I have, and I can give you a copy of, of which I was very proud and totally surprised. And if you look carefully at that picture, you will notice that by the time I got got that citation, I already was a civilian. I was discharged yeah. from the Army uh, for what was called the convenience of the government, and I got the equivalent rank of a lieutenant colonel, which was great. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> well, far more important, I got a car, and I got an apartment not very far from where Jackson uh, and Eamon where and I was allowed to go to all the parties and oh my god good for you oh that's that's terrific Actually, just just on location let me pull out my little cheat sheet on Maryland. here's Nuremberg to Firth at Dombach, and this is a little bit more detail of Firth. I don't know if these help at all, but just... John, I, I hate to tell you, I went back to Nuremberg in uh, 1965, uh -huh. in 1970, uh, and you know, more extensively in uh, 2002 and 2000, not in 2003, didn't have the time. And I looked and looked, and the one thing that eludes me is a memory of the geography with one exception. I, I did remember how to get from the courthouse to the Grand Hotel where the bar was. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I wish I could help you. <laughs> well, I, I actually have a theory that I'm coming to that, that somehow the Lindenstrasse area got redeveloped and doesn't exist anymore. Well, I, I couldn't tell you that, but I, I tell you what my memory is. I mean, I was close to Justice Jackson's office. And uh, his house? No, his no, office his in the courtroom. I mean, we were on the same floor. It was just around the corner from me. And I mean, you know, I used to bump into him on the hall. I sat in uh, interrogations rooms. And as you know, Bill was officially his assistant. Right. And Elsie Douglas was there. And uh, I mean, I knew her. However, uh, I think there was only one occasion uh, when I saw him at night. And I have to tell you, I don't know exactly, you know, who he kept company with at, at night because Eamon preferred, Eamon loved to drink scotch mm -hmm. and he had his own parties. And uh, mm -hmm. he had uh, a couple of Red Cross women there and some of the interrogators and there was a degree of, I won't call it animosity, but distance between Eamon and Story. And I, I think the reason was that you know, Story was an erudite and educated uh, jurist, mm -hmm. among other things. He headed the documentation division. And Eamon, you know, was a rough and ready litigator right. who came out of the Lepke and uh, murder incorporated right. trials. I mean, you know, a descendant of the Dewey days in New York. So they were, they were very distant. And then there, I don't know whether you've come across the name of Brundage. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Brundage and Amon were somewhat distant, but uh, Smith Brookhart, uh, Williams, I mean the regular members, the interrogation division was quite small, mm -hmm. and they were very cliquish. Okay. And by the way, they're very, very cliquish because we controlled the interrogation rooms. We controlled who could talk to which, uh, you know, defendant. And, you know, in the course of things, a lot of people were envious or annoyed. And I have to say, possibly with reason. I mean, you know, I, I wasn't involved in that. I was so busy. You know, trying to keep on top of things, and uh, I mean, I worked during lunch hour to keep up with the transcripts. We had to have the transcripts for the interrogator in the afternoon. You know, if it was a continuation of the interrogation in the morning. I just so I get clear, as far as from the prosecution side, the attorney side, the interrogators. Was it just a group headed by Colonel Amon and yes. there certain attorneys that? Did the Here's what happened. First of all, most of the, uh, let me call them, they were all material witnesses when we had access to them. Right. From the minute on that the indictments were served on them, we no longer had this access. We, you know, we were in discovery with them. And most of them had been captured by the Americans. Uh, a few of them, don't ask me how many, had been captured by the British, and the British handed them over to the Americans. Uh, two of them, Rader and Fritchie, had been captured by the Russians. And after the Nuremberg jail was set up, they were also put in the jail. And the jail was run by Colonel Andrews, who was an American. And uh, it was sort of a tacit understanding that the Americans would conduct all of the interrogations, but would make the transcripts available to the British and the uh, the Russians on request, and it turned out the British went very were not very interested in the interrogation because Mechwell Five relied on an enormous personal knowledge of German history and the extensive documentation. And when you read his interrogations in court, Maxwell Five hardly ever, you know, referred to an interrogation. So de facto, the interrogators, the regular interrogators, were all American. When on a rare occasion uh, a Britisher, I can't remember a Fran can't remember a French or Russian prosecutor ever, ever asking us to give them access to the prisoners. We would have, but the British did on rare occasions, particularly with Spare, I think uh, a few times, uh, Goering because of the bombing of uh, Britain and the uh, you know the battle. But the interrogation division and Colonel Amon as the head of it basically was in charge of the entire discovery proceeding so far as it took place at Nuremberg and so far as I know uh, there may have been exceptions I don't, I don't believe that many sworn affidavits were used in court during the actual proceedings unless the person uh, that had been interrogated physically couldn't travel to Nuremberg when they could travel to Nuremberg, what we would do with them, we'd interrogate them. And uh, we, we'd create a record, and in very important cases, I would retranslate, or somebody from the documentation division would retranslate the English record into German. We would read it <coughs> to the witness and get him to sign off that that is in fact what it said. So the interrogation division, which was one of the divisions of the American prosecution, the office of the chief of counsel had de facto, you know, virtual control over all of the uh, all of the inmates, if you if that's what you want to call them, in the jail. So, was there a set number of attorneys who did the interrogations? You mentioned Smith Brockhart as one of them. Uh, were there others? Uh, in <laughs> I the... tell you, Amon accommodated others. Uh, well, for instance, Whitney Harris was not a member of the interrogation division. Mm -hmm. I, I believe he was a member of the documentation division, but when Whitney Harris wanted to interrogate a prisoner, I mean, a witness, I mean, either he or Story went to Eamon and said, I'd like to talk to so-and-so about such and such, and that was always, you know, accommodated. So I remember Whitney Harris talking uh, 
to Hess, among others. Uh, I remember Whitney Harris talking to other members of the SS and, mm -hmm. you know, the SD. So, why the interrogation division staff itself, right, was quite small, when other members of the prosecution staff, and that included uh, Donovan, included uh, Robert Jackson himself, included Bill Jackson, when they had specific reasons, right, to interrogate somebody, uh, they came to Amon. And uh, I mean, during the time when I was the only interpreter, uh, I always interpreted those sessions and I, I was popular because, I mean, I have to say I became the chief interpreter because my interpretations gave rise to the least arguments about language and whatnot. Sure. I mean, I, I was bilingual and I had very few complaints, so I don't know whether I did 60% or 40% or 70%, but, you know, most of those interrogations. So, uh, did you, um, uh, did you, did your past cross Bill Donovan's at all? Yeah. I, I don't know whether you saw the uh, History Channel documentary on Albert Goering. That's all based on an interrogation of Albert Goering by Bill Donovan, for which I was the interpreter. No kidding. Oh, yeah. No, no, not, you were talking Bill Jackson. I, I'm so, what did I say? No, you, Bill, he meant Wild Bill Donovan. By Bill Donovan. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, I thought you meant, but yeah, well, let, let me tell you, there, again, I mean, I, I commented in my book, and it's in the English version, I mean, which is not published. There was a uh, dichotomy between Jackson, Donovan, and Eamon. And uh, when I say dichotomy, it's not the right word when you had three people with different objectives. And uh, if I were to simplify them, I would tell you this, that Jackson's, uh, I think, prime objective was to convict these people with documents, with original German documents that either they had signed or whose authenticity wasn't questionable because he was afraid that uh, testimony from German witnesses, which was the only thing that counted, would later be questioned and people would allege, well, they had just testified trying to save their own skin. At any rate, Jackson himself put more weight on unchallengeable, unchallengeable documentary evidence than anything else. Uh, Donovan had a completely different goal. Donovan wanted a courtroom confession if he could possibly get it from Goering as to how evil the whole thing was, so as to be able to parade a senior Nazi in the courtroom, in front of the German people, have the newsreels recorded and blah, 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 in sort of a rueful confession of the evils of Nazism. And Donovan tried to find somebody uh, to, to uh, to turn state's testimony, uh, I don't know whether that's the right word, so to speak, right? And he tried Goering, uh, he tried Spear, and uh, I come in on Spear separately, and he tried others, and he never, <clears throat> he never succeeded in doing that, and uh, because of that, he got to cross purposes uh, with Jackson, which are, <clears throat> you know, uh, described in Taylor's book. I don't know whether you've read it, and uh, you know, to this acrimonious exchange of letters and uh, Donovan finally leaving, but I was Donovan's interpreter, uh, you know, for most of the stuff that went on in the tug of war, and when the tug of war got serious enough, then Jackson himself <coughs> decided to do some interrogations. He interrogated Goering, he interrogated Ribbentrop. Now, Eamon, as chief of the interrogation division, had a completely different goal from those two. His goal was to get a deposition uh, from these then material witnesses, right? That he could use uh, either in direct examination of the witnesses <laughs> or cross-examination of the defendants in the courtroom because he was a litigator. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty good at it. I mean, I don't know whether you've ever read his <laughs> famous cross-examination of Ribbentrop which started out, he says, I don't know German, 
I don't know whether you have the equivalent of the word yes man. <coughs> and Ribbentrop said, yeah. I said, ein ja sager. And Eamon said to him, isn't that exactly what you were? <laughs> I mean, you, you know, it's in the record. So what I'm saying to you, because these three, right, <clears throat> I mean, they all wanted convictions, of course, but they, they had totally different objectives. What, what happened in the courtroom in the end, and this was long after Donovan's departure, you know, Spare in his own defense stood up and denounced the Nazi system and Hitler and everything that had gone in Germany in uh, pretty strong terms. I mean, he characterized the rule as evil. Uh, it's self-defeating. He challenged the, uh, you know, Fuhrer principle, the principle of a, you know, all-knowing guy. And he, he so indicted the Nazi system and so impressed the judges that they never noticed that he didn't admit to any personal crimes that he had committed. So he came the closest, right? I mean, shocked, did it in a different way. I mean, he denounced Hitler as having not listened to him. But so Speer, in the courtroom, long after Donovan departed, came about the uh, closest, right, to being a crown witness. But. Uh, and, you know, you you can read Telford Taylor's book. It it got pretty rough there at times. And uh, That's right. I mean, there, there's a passage in my book and in, in other books where I got into arguments with uh, Donovan. I was a PFC and he was a general about the exact answer that Goering had given. And I rendered it as, uh, I don't agree to that. And uh, Donovan said, Dick, that's not what he said. He said, I... I don't admit that. And Goering sat there laughing and he says, I said, I do not agree to that. <laughs> you know, oh. I was in favor and he didn't like that. Oh, that's terrific. Oh, man. I can listen to this guy all night. This, uh, I, do, do keep track of your watch so that we don't yeah, keep no, him worse. Okay. Don't worry. Uh, 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 you were hmm. involved in the serving of the indictments on the defendants. How did that come about? How did you get selected? Just because of your interpretive ability? Well, uh, how did I get selected? I, I will tell you first what happened. Sure. <clears throat> it was, I mean, the reason I know, I, I, have the, uh, I have the piece of paper with the original signatures on it. I got a call at 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, which was... October the 30th, I think it was a Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Date, i absolutely sure, from Colonel Williams, who was a member of the interrogation division, but he was the operations officer. And he says, uh, get your ass over here. <laughs> well, so, you know, I'm a PFC, I come to his office, and in his office there's an assembled group of uh, colonels and uh, Marjorie Hackett, who was Colonel Eamon's personal secretary with a pencil, and he says, raise your right hand, raise my right hand, and he says, do you swear that you will faithfully translate the conversations that are going to take place between uh, Major Airy Neve, who was a representative of the tribunal and the defendants for the purpose of sending the indictments today? I said, I do. And... Uh, that was that, and uh, then Colonel Williams said to me, by the way, you will also act as an observer for the prosecution, because I will ask you afterwards whether you saw the indictments being handed out and that they were served. I mean, Ari Neve was an officer of the court, and I, I'm not enough of a student of law to know whether normally the court or the prosecution hands out the indictments, I don't know. But at any rate, so, how was I selected? I think here's what happened, that Airy Neve needed an interpreter. Mm -hmm. The British didn't have an interpreter handy. Uh, Airy Neve uh, spoke a little bit of German. And I would say, you know, I had talked to every one of those defendants, you know, without a problem before. I mean, I had been, you know, very uh, successful as an interpreter in the interrogation. So who selected me and why? 
I can't tell you, but I have to tell you, there is a cottage industry of people who claim they were there when the indictments were served, and some of them are outright liars, right. because they describe scenes that never take place, and I won't mention names. Uh, I tell you who was there. Colonel Andrews was there. Mm -hmm. He marched right behind us. A uh, two Russian officers, whose name I don't know. There were two guards. Uh, there was Neve and myself, mm -hmm. and who else may or may not have been present, you know, in the jail of those who now say they were. I cannot tell you, but the procedure was very simple. We we had a little table, and, the, you know, the table was set up in front of each cell. Mm -hmm. We moved the table. I mean, it was an army field table. And uh, we got the uh, prisoner. I mean, the door was open. The guard was there. The prisoner had a chair, and we made him sit down uh, in front of the table, and I read him. The, uh, I mean, Neve, uh, you know, would say a few words. We're here to serve the indictment on you. And the first thing uh, Goering said, I mean, Chuck said, am I before the judge? We had to explain informally what serving the indictment meant. And I then read, you know, the main parts of the indictment uh, to every one of the 20. Wow. And it was gruesome. I mean, it took took the whole afternoon into... The evening, and I mean, I was dry in the mouth, and I mean, Goering made the fam famous statement, uh, which was picked up by Time Magazine. I don't know whether you've seen it. Sure. I mean, he looked at me and he says, in the courtroom, I'm going to need a good interpreter more than an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was obviously referring to his ability to defend himself, which was considerable, but well, I, I think, to, to answer your question, I mean, as I explained before, the jail itself, you know, it was run by Colonel Andrews, who was an American officer. Uh, contact, direct contact, you know, with the man who were material witnesses who all of a sudden became def defendants was under the direct authority of Colonel Amon. Mm -hmm. So I think the court, you know, undoubtedly went to the American prosecution. I mean, you know, Nivka, the, the, the indictments were approved, to, were approved in Berlin, you know that, by the, by the American Control Commission. And I don't believe that Jackson was in Nuremberg at the time. They were either driven or flown down to Nuremberg. The Control Commission yes. approved them on the 19th. Uh, Neve was there, either came with him, he was an officer of the court, but the contact, you know, with the, with the inmates was exclusively an American affair, and I can only assume that somebody must have said, well, if you're going to hand the indictments out, we want our own man there. Sure. What were some of the reactions of the defendants, some of the memorable reactions? I mean, aside from the fact they're probably stunned and mad and... Well, Look, the first reaction of every one of them, almost every one of them was, they, they were not familiar with American law. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, the, uh, the tribunal uh, did not proceed exactly under American law, but certainly under a derivative, you know, of Anglo-Saxon common law. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were not, you know, familiar with the procedure. And they, the first question was, they looked at Neve and me and say, are we before a judge? Because some of them expected uh, the answer to be yes and to be told you're guilty and you're going to be shot. So we explained to them. And uh, the next thing is we explained to them that we, that they were entitled to have defense lawyers. And Neve had a list. I mean, uh, the tribunal and we had prepared a list of German lawyers that uh, could be acceptable to try to perhaps do it was hard to find and that was a big surprise. Mm -hmm. And uh I mean during as I told you said I need a good interpreter now more than I need an attorney. Yeah. Ribbon trouble all but collapsed. I mean Keitel I could see I described it, I could see the artery in his <laughs> neck pounding and he paled. Uh Yodel uh you know was a ramrod soldier, uh 
Shuck managed to uh, radiate total disdain. I mean, he, from the very beginning, he said, I don't know what you're indicting me for. I never took part in any of these things. I mean, you're wrong and I'm right. Uh, Stryker, I mean, immediately saw it as a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, I, I got to tell you what I remember more, much more than the individual reaction. I mean, as, as I went along with the exception of Goering, uh, shocked, I mean, who, apart from being extremely arrogant, had a towering intellect, uh, and Spare, uh, who didn't look like a criminal and didn't act like a criminal, uh, and was obviously highly intelligent. You know, the realization grew in me what ordinary people these were. And uh, what, uh, what yes men they had been. And you know, by the time I got to the 10th or 12th, that almost became a revelation to me because I said to myself, who, who but a yes man? could have ever worked for a dictator for 20 years. You know, he insulted them, he commanded them if they had any gumption, uh, or even noticed that he was insulting them. You know, they would have left. And then I realized what third class uh, people they were, you know, with the, uh, with the exception of going. And, and I gotta tell you, that was a frightening realization in a sense because it made it clear to me that, you know, if you had a uh, demonic uh, personality or a uh, hypnotist, uh, this could all happen again because you could find another bunch of ordinary people who would carry out commands, right? And the only defense, you know, the only defense most of them had was they merely did what they were commanded to do. They, they did not really challenge that it was criminal. They just said we had no choice. We had to do what we had. So, uh, I mean, I, I tell you, it was such an exhausting. Did you do it on one day or was it two days? Did it all in one afternoon. Now, Carlton Brunner, he wasn't there then, was he? He was sick. Sick, yeah. And uh, Von Krupp was, was sick. I mean, he was not there. Lai had committed suicide. Uh, was Hess there then? Who? Hess. Oh yeah. Who's there, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, this is October 9th. Okay. All right. Okay. Couple of unrelated questions, because I because I can spend I can spend 20 hours with you, Dick, and we will before before this year is over. We will spend. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you, you know how to inflict punishment on yourself. Uh, I love this. This is great <laughs> stuff. You're the real deal. Uh, Lenny Riefenstahl. Did you have any reason to uh, be part of, uh, of an interrogation of her? No. Okay. I, I don't know who did it. I, uh, I saw her. I, unless I'm terribly mistaken, uh, she was never indicted. I, don't know. I, I believe she uh, once, uh, she was in the visitor's gallery and somebody pointed her out to me, mm -hmm. uh, as was Yola's wife who was removed. But, uh, you know, I, I followed her career, I mean, up to the fact that she died just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Schulberg got her in Berlin, right, Jack? Mm -hmm. And brought her to Nuremberg well, to be a material witness. Somewhere wind. in Bavaria, at her yeah, yeah. chateau. Like, or... so, well, he... <laughs> just, there may have been a tie in here. <laughs> um, also... Walter Schellenberg. Obergruppenführer Walter Schellenberg. Chef des Einsatzkommandos A or B, I don't remember. What was he like? Well, I tell you what, he uh, <coughs> was a very slight man, um, as was Ollendorf. Um, if you met him on the street, you would have thought he was a civilized human being. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he was what I call a befelsmensch. He was uh, 
a link in a chain, and the way the chain worked, he needed somebody above him to give him orders, and he needed somebody below him to yell at. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't have functioned without either. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he, he was one of those who had to take an oath of personal loyalty to both Himmler and Hitler. And, I mean, I had a very interesting conversation uh, with Hess, who was a commandant, many in conversations with Hess, who was a commandant of uh, Auschwitz. And, uh, I mean, at one point Hess said, you know, we were told that the, uh, the Jews were the cause of all of the problems that the Germans had. You know, there was a famous uh, slogan which says the Jews are our misfortune. And he said, I heard it over and over and over from Himmler. And uh, exterminating them, to me, was a duty of a good German soldier. He said, it's not until after the war, and when I came to Nuremberg, that I ever had reason to question what I was told by Himmler. And uh, when you take Schallenberg and Ohlendorf, despite the fact that they were very intelligent uh, people, I believe both of them with the university education, who had been, you know, reasonably uh, mid-level uh, bureaucrats before, they did not question that. And to them, uh, you know, it was a command to be performed. And I'm sure you've read their, you know, their testimony uh, in court. And I have to tell you, their main interrogator uh, was Bookhart. Yeah. Uh, and he interrogated them for the purpose of uh, convicting Kaltenbrunner Whereas Whitney Harris uh, interrogated them for the purpose of making a case against the SD and the SS and the organizations. And to an extent, I mean, the same thing happened uh, with Hess, uh, who was a commandant of Auschwitz and Zerreis, I mean, whom we tried to get early on. There were two completely different reasons for the interrogation. Yeah. One was the conviction of you know, to get to get testimony to convict a specific defendant. And by the way, one of the defendants was Yodel and another was Keitel because they were accused of complete knowledge and uh, uh, support of what these Einsatzgruppen did, right? On the other hand, here was Whitney Harris who had, you know, responsibility. I don't remember whether he had responsibility for all, but, wow, well, he had responsibility for the SD and the SS mm -hmm. uh, and Gestapo organization cases, I believe somebody, I think Taylor had it for the uh, general staff. So, you know, these were different okay. streams in the investigation. And, you know, these witnesses were accessed uh, by different members of the prosecution staff, you know, for different reasons. But, uh, you know, Hus, uh, I don't know whether he ever came across the name Sunday Yari. Well, Sunday Yari was a member, he was a Finn, who was drunk most of the time. He was the most, he was a, I think he was just a lieutenant. Uh, he was the most capable member of the prosecution division because of the interrogation division, because he had the most knowledge. And he, he was the original interrogator of Hus, and I was there with him. And uh, Yari uh, interrogated him in German, and that's where we discovered the original material, which became the basis, you know, for all the other interrogations. Okay. And uh, I mean, you know, the first question to Hurst, I mean, you know about that. Is it true that you killed three and a half million people? And uh, he looked absolutely angry. He said, "It's not true. It was only two and a half." Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you've heard all of that, but oh. that was Senda Yari who produced the original uh, documentation, J-A-R-I. If you ever get into the, uh, you know, the, um, the archives, right. you will find interrogations by Yari. You will also find in interrogations for, by Kempner. I'm sure, sure you had heard that name. Kempner, for instance, uh, interrogated Goring, and he interrogated him in German. And then as the interpreter, I had the job of simultaneously 
translating what Kempney asked him in German into English and what Goering answered in German into English. So I produced the English record, and by the way, that's how I got to be chief interpreter because Kempner looked at the transcript and couldn't find the mistake. Oh, Peter. <laughs> Gosh, what a small world. But, I mean, that's a whole other story. But uh, do I remember Schallenberg and, and Ohlendorf very well? But I have to say they, they behaved in interrogation just exactly as they did on the witness stand. And I was, you know, I was in the courtroom on relatively rare occasions. I was in the courtroom when a litigator would either uh, have one of these witnesses in direct examination or in cross-examination. I was there basically to verify that what they were saying in court is exactly you know, it was exactly the same as what they had said in the interrogation. Yeah. And uh, there was never a discrepancy. I mean, it was amazing. Schallenberg and Ollendorf, uh, I think they knew they were going to be shot or hanged. Uh, and, they, you know, they, they had a very simple attitude. We were soldiers, you know, of the Reich, and we did what we were told, as did us. Yeah. This guy's terrific, and, uh, but I also know that you got a time schedule and You've got a time schedule. Right. Um, here's what I, I need to go pick up my daughter at Hebrew school in yeah. 20 minutes. All right. Uh, and you need to start heading for the airport. Yeah, so why don't we, we can probably draw closure to this, right? What yeah. time is your plane? Eight. Well. Yeah. But we're going to, this is just a, this is just a teaser. Are you kidding me, Dick? This is so exciting. You know what he needs to do is come with us to Nuremberg. You know, why don't you well, when are you going? January, we're going to leave the 15th, 15th through the 20th. 